Okay, so we're recording. Anytime well, you want to. Okay. Uh, hi, this is Bob Bruniga, WB4APR, and usually I talk uh, about APRS, and so I will be giving a, uh, a presentation. Uh, let's see if we can get the screen up. And so this is for the MicroHams uh, Conference 2021. And I'll be speaking about universal digital communications, basically APRS and uh, uh, emergency operations. Uh, APRS, I believe most everybody should know what it is. It's been around almost 28 years, but the goal is a universal information data channel where anywhere, anytime, any country, any place, just go to the national APRS channel, monitor for about 10 minutes, and you should be able to capture all the information um, of everything going on in ham radio about you or around you. Uh, this uh, shows the, the uh, continental wide frequencies uh, in most cases. So anywhere you are, go to that frequency and tune it in. This is an example of what you would see on an APRS map uh, around uh, Redmond, Washington, for example. I'm, I would guesstimate there's probably uh, 250 um, uh, stations on there all within a range of about uh, uh, 30 mile map. So you see uh, APRS is definitely out there. Uh, of course, APRS being a, an information exchange uh, channel, um, it is really used in field operations and special events, getting out there and doing something with amateur radio. And, and so when I tell you to tune into your, the national APRS channel, and you're gonna see all this activity. If you don't, then guess what? Nobody is putting the information out. So uh, the channel of course is dependent then on everybody putting their information uh, that they're aware of relative to the event uh, onto their APRS screen so that everybody else can see it. Uh, of course, uh, at the same time with my background of 27 years of APRS, uh, for the last 10 years or so, I've really gotten involved in energy and have written this uh, book uh, for the ARRL called Energy Choices for the Radio Amateurs. So you'll see a lot of emphasis on um, uh, emergency power in, in this presentation. Uh, this is, in the past, has been my lead inside. It, it shows me about the 10 years ago uh, at a typical uh, scouting event where I'm providing amateur radio communications in my communications trailer uh, powered by the uh, my uh, uh, plug-in Prius. Anyway, it's a whole new world of power. Uh, this was emphasized uh, again this very month by the cover photo on uh, QST uh, of the Chevy Bolt electric vehicle being used for roving. Although he didn't, uh, although he emphasized uh, the clean energy aspects of the car, he he actually cautioned against uh, uh, tapping into the vehicle system uh, for fear of, uh, you know, the dealer saying, well, you've touched uh, the 12 volt battery and so uh, uh, it might void your warranty. But anyway, uh, hams are gonna do what they're gonna do. And uh, uh, the battery in the Volt, for example, is 66 kilowatt hours of uh, uh, energy storage. And so that at one kilowatt continuous, that's 66 hours of continuous operation. So anyway, uh, APRS hardware, uh, it used to be, you know, a laptop and software and a radio and a TNC and uh, uh, hooked up to, uh, you know, radio and an antenna. And, uh, but for the last 20, 20 years or so, uh, it's been embedded into uh, primarily the Kenwood and uh, Yezu radios as shown here. Uh, on the radio front panel is where you have a plethora of information um, and lists and uh, on each station that's, that shows up on the radio um, APR station, you've got five, almost five pages of additional information uh, that you can click around and take a look at. And of course the map uh, information is showed up on an attached GPS. Um, hopefully it's a, it's a GPS with a mapping application and that allows you to see uh, all, all the information that would be on a map. Uh, for those uh, uh, digital heads, uh, down at the bottom, I'm showing what a typical APRS packet look like, looks like, and it's AX25, and it starts with the, uh, in blue down there, it starts with the uh, from call sign, and then the to call is, is, is not, uh, not 
uh, really used. Well, the two call has to begin with the letters AP to indicate that it's part of the APRS network. And then there's the uh, Digipeter field, which is wide 2-2, which says send this packet out two hops in all directions through uh, uh, all Digipeters uh, that hear this. And then the first character of the packet, uh, the X here, uh, is almost any letter of the alphabet. And each one of those defines a packet format as to what information is contained in that packet, whether it's a message or a uh, position report or whatever. Um, and one of the most important things about ham radio, of course, is communications. And so uh, I consider uh, uh, APRS to be the primary universal ham radio text messaging uh, initiative. And I looked at all the systems that were available. And I think it's, yeah, 26 separate systems, um, all of which are vertical, in, in, vertically integrated and in they'll talk to each other and uh, their other people with their same application, but they don't across, talk across uh, platforms. Well, APRS can provide that across platform uh, connectivity um, and tie it all together, both locally and globally, whether all you have is a, a handheld uh, Palm Pilot, for example, uh, and you wanna send a message to somebody with an HT out on a boat, uh, you can do that with APRS, theoretically. Um, so APRS is basically a local VHF, you know, just a couple of miles um, uh, activity, except that uh, somewhere in that local area, there's usually somebody who's online and has their uh, APRS equipment um, uh, connected uh, uh, to both the radio on one side and uh, the internet on the other. And so absolutely everything going on in your area is transferred into the uh, global APRS internet uh, connectivity. And anybody can anywhere on earth can go to that uh, uh, APRS cloud, I, I, I will say, and uh, see what's going on anywhere and everywhere. In addition to that, of course, satellites fly over your local area and uh, you can also participate uh, in satellite uh, APRS communications, and that extends your, your quote, local range from a few miles to, of course, uh, most of the country for about five minutes. Um, anyway, the, uh, the whole idea of these, uh, the APRS application is a, a ham radio uh, applications focus. Um, this slide was primarily prepared for when I uh, was trying to get support for an APRS satellite. Uh, and to point out that the focus is really enabling the connectivity of all this hardware that's out there. So the APRS terrestrial uh, data relay network is, uh, is universal, it's everywhere. This is a map when you zoom out to the uh, whole, uh, whole country. And, uh, but now this, uh, this next slide here is a typical uh, use of APRS for a special event. This is the 40 mile uh, Appalachian Trail run uh, in Maryland, it's once a year. And um, it's a uh, ham radio provides communication support all along uh, that 40 mile stretch of the Appalachian Trail. And the circles show you the range of the uh, digipeters along the way. And so you see that there's one up here in the upper uh, Northwest that provides uh, almost uh, total coverage all along the trail. Um, uh, coming at, at it from the side. A lot of people think, well, you want to put your digipeter on top of the ridge that goes through Maryland. And no, if you put it on uh, top of the ridge of the Appalachian Trail, then your height above average terrain along the trail is no more than the height of your antenna above ground right there. So uh, the beautiful thing about operating a special event along a ridge is all you need is one digipeter about 20 miles away off to the side and, and you, you hit the, the entire uh, route. And uh, the point of this particular slide is that uh, most people, uh, we, we talk about APRS activity being on the national channel. Uh, that's true. Um, and it's always good to have your special event on the national channel so that people can just show up as is, and you'll not only see them driving to the event, participating in the event and, and so forth, um, so that's why you want to have your uh, your event usually on 144.39. Also, it allows you to go maybe beyond your initial planned range and, and hit other digipeters. However, 
uh, when you're operating a special event on the national channel so that everybody in the world can see it, again, because of the internet connectivity, um, you need to, uh, uh, all of the participants are also colliding with all the other existing traffic on the channel. And so there are uh, collisions and, uh, and, and a loss of uh, throughput. The, the, way, the easiest way to fix that for a special event is go out to the one or two special digipeters that cover the area of the event and switch them from 144.39, the national APRS channel uh, in the USA, uh, switch it to have a plus 600 uh, or a um, ha have the digipeter uh, set it to 144.99 with a minus 600 offset so that it is transmitting on 144.39. Again, so it's on the national channel, everybody gets to see it. But the users of your event are transmitting with their radio set to plus 600 standard offset. And now the only thing that those digipeters are seeing on their input is the participants in the event and the, uh, but the output is on 144.39. And that improves, uh, if you see the map over here on the right, uh, we, uh, we had somebody go along the trail uh, first transmitting on the 144.39 uh, national frequency. And those are all the blue dots um, on the right-hand side. The, uh, all of the uh, position reports that were received via the 600 uh, kilohertz offset are shown in red. And you see it's about uh, three times as much. So you vastly improve your special event operation on the national channel if you switch your local digipeters to a plus 600 offset. Um, to show you uh, the lower left, it's just a, a picture, but it's a picture of uh, my attempt. I, I haven't officially claimed it anywhere, but for the longest underground uh, cave radio communications network ever. Uh, I got special permission to go into the Mammoth Cave and uh, carry along the as many walkie-talkies, uh, the, the Kenwood uh, radio will uh, digipete walkie-talkie, and then a couple of the D700s uh, with, you know, a gel cell battery. And with these 13 uh, digipeters, um, we could go along the, the, the cave and we got a mile underground and we're still able to communicate. So anybody with a, a APRS HT anywhere along that mile uh, could communicate because of the, the digipeters. It's amazing that uh, individually you, you can only communicate about a hundred yards at the most when you're in a cave. And so by having multiple uh, digipeters like that, we were able to uh, really surprise the uh, National Park Service as, as to our ability to communicate. Um, now here is, uh, a, a lot of people don't try, try to track the individual runners uh, at a special event. This is that same special event where there were, I think, uh, at least a hundred uh, runners. And normally you have, you know, fixed APRS stations along the route who report as the runners go by. And uh, in this case, uh, my son is a very active person. And so I asked him uh, to do a special uh, reporting by taking the walkie-talkie in one hand, starting at the finish, and then uh, running back towards the start uh, with nothing but this HT. And so you see the, the messages are listed uh, uh, newest, uh, no, oldest at the bottom. So the first message that he sent um, was at, uh, his call sign is hiker number two, uh, was at 1142. And at that point, he had seen runners 29, number 129, and 108. So he just typed in those numbers, and then he didn't see anybody else in his field of view, and so he hit enter and transmitted that message. Then he continued to run along the trail, and at 1203, uh, he had accumulated another seven runner numbers, and then didn't see anybody for a while, so he hit send and sent that as the message. And so you see, uh, uh, then at 1226, about 20 minutes later, he had accumulated another uh, eight uh, runner numbers and so forth. And so by the time he got, at, uh, uh, let's see, at 1342, which was an hour later, and he had gotten to the start of the trail, 
uh, he had reported the position of every 100 runners and he did it one person with nothing but a walkie talkie. Uh, and you say, well, that's just, uh, that, that's a time and a runner number. But of course the position of the hiker, uh, my son with the HT is, was also being transmitted. So you, the people uh, could see on the map uh, where it was that those runner numbers uh, were seen. So anyway, APRS is really ideal for this kind of uh, communications when you have uh, uh, information of a digital uh, or written format that you want to communicate. Anyway, this is uh, me typically showing up at uh, field day. And um, in the lower right is uh, me holding one of the amateur satellites that I built over about the last uh, 15 years at the Naval Academy. But when I go to field day, I, I take along a, a solar trailer to power everything, uh, my communication shelter, and of course the, uh, uh, the Prius. Now, here I'm getting into energy a little bit because if you really want to talk about portable operating power, you need to think about an electric vehicle. Uh, even a hybrid has a 50,000 watt generator. And that's kind of a, a, a ham's dream is to have a 10 kilowatt generator. Here, if you're driving around in a Prius, you've got a 50,000 watt generator that goes with you everywhere you go. Or if it's a battery electric car, such as a Leaf uh, with a 16 uh, ki kilowatt, well, I, it's a little bit bigger than that. But the typical battery electric car has anywhere from 16 to 85 kilowatt hours of battery storage. That's a tremendous amount of storage. Uh, this is my most recent project. Uh, I started it, uh, well, it's about a year uh, ago now. I finally bought a real electric car in the form of a Chevy Volt, but I wanted to have solar panels on the top. So I made it so that when I lifted up the hatchback and inserted uh, these plywood uh, side curtains in the side, I could mount an, a flat array of about 250 watts of uh, uh, solar panels. Um, and a lot of people say, well, that's really... Uh, you can't charge an electric car uh, during a power outage. Let me start that over. The energy in your car is more than sufficient to power your house for a couple of days or a week. Um, and so, but some people say, yeah, but how, what do you, how do you recharge your, your car? Well, the answer is uh, when the electric grid goes down, Almost anybody anywhere can go outside, look around, and you'll see lights somewhere. Wherever you see those lights, that's power. You can drive over there and ask, ask them to let you plug in uh, to recharge uh, the energy in your car. And of course, EVs don't wait in gas lines. Uh, one of the first things that becomes critical during a grid down event is the gas stations are unable to pump the gas out of the tank or they pump it all out and there's none left for all the generators that people want to run. So um, uh, I, I, I've been more than satisfied with operating at my house for my electric vehicle during a good event. So again, this is a, a graphical image of uh, the amount of energy stored in a Leaf's uh, battery of about 40 kilowatt hours. And you can buy a used Leaf. It's only three years old, looks almost brand new. Uh, and the going price is only about $9,000. And by the way, the, that 40 kilowatt hours is equivalent to three Tesla power walls costing $21,000. So there are a lot of people that go out and, and buy a Tesla power wall for um, uh, backup energy. And it just sits on their wall uh, 364 days out of the year uh, and might get used one day a year. Whereas if you power your house from your electric car, uh, you've got it with you everywhere you go. Uh, again, I've made the point that, that the, uh, every hybrid, of course, has in addition to, uh, well, they don't have very big batteries. They don't need it because they've got the 50,000 watt generator uh, under the hood. Um, so this slide kind of says it all about the perfect marriage between electric vehicles as a backup power system and, and solar panels. And that is 12 solar panels costing about $1,200 can fully charge a plug-in electric vehicle every day forever. No more dependency on foreign oil or price fluctuation uh, and so forth. 
and it's just transportation forever, energy forever, and it's something you can use every day. Uh, so to me, this is the golden slide uh, that, that makes my point. So we're now 10 years into the electric vehicle revolution with 66 models now on the market. Uh, and uh, almost anybody can find uh, in those 66 models, uh, one that uh, to them is better, faster, cleaner, safer, quieter, cheaper to buy with incentives, cheaper to operate, uh, half to a third the cost of gas and cheaper to maintain compared to a gas car. And you never have to leave the house uh, uh, to refuel. Uh, this is a, a picture of, uh, well, last year anyway, of the, back then it was 50, no, 62 uh, models of electric car are on the market. The one on the left uh, are all battery electric. Uh, they have uh, typical long ranges from 100 to 250 to 300 miles. Batteries have huge batteries in them. Uh, on the right are uh, this uh, a slightly bigger list of the plug-in hybrids. Um, and they uh, typically have ranges on the order of 25 to 40 miles for daily electric use. And then because they're carrying along a, a gas engine backup that just uh, seamlessly transitions uh, once you've used up the, the battery capacity. Um, here I'm switching over to another use of uh, uh, APRS. It's kind of my favorite signature event. And that was we wanted to demonstrate uh, setting up an APRS network on the fly that could communicate along the Appalachian Trail from uh, Maine to Georgia. And so uh, during the second uh, or the third weekend every July, about 14 to 15 of us uh, go uh, climb, uh, or everybody but about three of us drive to a nearby parking lot along the Appalachian Trail, set up their APRS network, and the goal is to be able to, you know, communicate what we call the golden packet, uh, communicating uh, end to end. Uh, the, the toughest job here and uh, is uh, climbing up to the top of Mount Katahdin. Uh, that's a 5,000 foot mountain and he's got to climb it, get up there for operating during the event at noon and get back down before the sun sets. Um, this is my operating position about halfway up. Uh, let me back up. I, I'm at the, uh, what we call GD Hill Park in uh, central Pennsylvania. And my, uh, it's a uh, hundred foot tower uh, that's open to the public. And so I take my APRS station up there and set it up. And the first year uh, I carried along some solar panels and uh, a gel cell or two and just barely made it because uh, it was cloudy and it rained and you can't depend on solar power for one time uh, special events because you just don't know what the weather is gonna be. And again, I had two laptops, a 50 watt dual band radio, HTs and APRS and everything else and had to run for six hours. So again, what did I use? I used a single wire earth return to uh, run this, this single wire, you see it here, uh, all the way back 3000 feet uh, or, uh, or three fifths of a mile um, back to my car in the parking lot and was able to operate. Uh, this is uh, uh, my uh, my team, which is my son WA4 APR and, and my daughter WE4 APR, um, and uh, uh, Rory helped uh, uh, a couple of years up at the top because that's all the equipment we had to power uh, carry up to the top. And of course, um, using single wire earth return is not approved by the National Electric Code. You know, you're playing with high voltage on a uh, piece of hookup wire. But the way it works is you just take a, a, a simple inverter and it can be a, let's see if my next picture, yeah, a plug-in cigarette lighter inverter can provide 140 watts of power at 110 volts AC. Um, you run that into, I'll go back one, you run that into a little uh, mini box that just has two capacitors and two diodes, which doubles that um, uh, 120 volts AC, uh, doubles it to 330 volts DC, that's what you run along the uh, thousands of feet of, um, uh, in my case, it was number 22 hookup wire. And then at the other end, uh, you've got anywhere from 100 to 300 volts DC, depending on the load. But the beautiful thing about uh, the current state of the art is that almost everything, laptops, cell phone chargers, uh, just about everything now runs on universal power supplies. 
and uh, they can take anything from 100 to three, uh, 100 to 240 volts AC according to the nameplate, but uh, anything that runs uh, uh, on a universal power supply, the first thing they do is full wave rectify that, which means internally it's operating at 330 volts DC. So this is the entire package that allows me to deliver uh, a couple of hundred watts of power over thousands of feet uh, from the uh, battery, in, in this case, the 12 volt battery in my electric car. The fact that this electric car is, is immaterial. Um, so getting back to ideal uses of APRS, this is uh, a, a use at a, um, a scouting event where the objective was to uh, report, you can see it up in the upper right-hand corner here on the screen, um, back to net control, uh, the troop number and the score at each of 20 different stations along the, the, the Camp Ari. And hams have been doing this for years um, uh, in the local area. And that's an awful lot of hams with an awful lot of HTs. And that's an awful lot of voice track traffic every uh, 30 minutes when the whistle blows and they move on to the next station. And you can imagine, uh, you know, the reporting of numbers and waiting for the time and, oh, I lost my pencil and are you ready to receive and all that. So I said, let's do that by APRS. All you have to do is type in five numbers, the troop number, the score, and hit send. At that point, the uh, amateur operator at that station uh, is done. And he doesn't have to worry about it getting through because the radio will retry that message until it's eventually delivered. And delivery is we just simply put the control head for a Kenwood D700, uh, attached it to a clipboard. And on that control head, this is what the message looks like. And the, the uh, net control operator can see that he's got uh, uh, five messages there from station number seven, number two, uh, and so forth. And the time that it was received. And then when he clicks on one of those, he gets the troop number and the score. And he can write that down. And you say, well, he's still having to manually write it down. Yes, but look how simple it is. And since this is a ham club that has never done uh, APRS radios before, uh, at first they were hesitant to try it. They said, this will never work. And then they realized there's nothing to it. The net control operator just clicks on the next message, writes down the number, hits uh, delete and moves on. And he can do it at his own pace because the information is being accumulated in the radio and he doesn't need to be worried about being interrupted and so forth on the voice net. Yeah, that's a typical use of, of APRS for uh, uh, messaging. Um, finally, of course, the most valuable thing uh, at APRS at special events or uh, covering a wide area is uh, all the objects. Any operator can put an object on the map for everybody to see, uh, not only where it is, but uh, uh, there's over th uh, 3,000 uh, different possible symbols. Uh, actually, there's about 200, but that can be expanded um, on a local basis. And so the ability to put objects on the map is very powerful uh, capability of APRS from the beginning. But finally, with the THD 74, the latest Kenwood radio uh, several years ago, you can now finally enter an object uh, from the HT. So uh, if you're at the site of a fire, uh, you can just enter the name of the object as a fire and then uh, uh, you know, use the current location where you're located and uh, your radio will transmit, and again, not only your position, but also the location of that object and, uh, and keep everybody informed. Um, and this just kind of uh, goes through the menus to show you how uh, you first uh, save the position where you're at, if you're at the location of the object, and then uh, it, it goes into a, a position memory and then you upload that. Uh, so anyway, the, uh, this is another one of the slides I use when I'm promoting uh, amateur uh, satellites. And that is the amateur radio applications focus. And that is, um, and, and a lot of that is emergency response. And of course, again, here I was catering to the Naval Academy. And so, you know, had, a, had kind of a military look there to it. Uh, another example of uh, uh, APRS radios is uh, remote sensing using APRS. Uh, during the spring, summer, and fall, I'd say every, every other week or so, there's a balloon launch uh, going up somewhere. 
And nowadays it's uh, just trivial to uh, uh, just throw together an APRs transmitter, a battery and a GPS and, um, and have a, a balloon. Uh, these days, of course, uh, balloons have gotten smaller and smaller and lighter and lighter. And now to the uh, point where they can go around the world. And of course you lose connectivity once they go out over the ocean. And so I use that as a justification of why we need APRS satellites covering those areas. And so now we're to the place that this slide is actually two years ago. Uh, and now it's trivial for uh, people to build a balloon that can go around the world multiple times. And you can see why. You see how small it is there on the left. Uh, or uh, now the one on the left did not have a GPS tracker. The one on the right um, was one of the first ones to go around the world. And now, like I say, they routinely go around the world multiple times. I've already indicated how all this information is collected by uh, internet gateways, uh, any ham radio station running an APRS uh, software, uh, and it's all fed into the, the internet. Uh, now, again, uh, the last 27 years, I was at the Naval Academy in the satellite lab, and so we were really into satellites. And this shows you uh, at any instant in time where all the amateur satellites are. And if you look closely at it, it's hard to read, but this is a, a, a two hour timeline and it's showing you the elevation angle uh, on the vertical axis and time on the right uh, on the horizontal axis. And you can see there is a satellite in view uh, almost all the time. And I like this plot because the height of the elevation angle is a, a clue to how close the satellite is gonna be to you and how good of a pass it's gonna be. So if you haven't uh, looked into uh, uh, amateur satellites, there, there's always one, almost always one in view or will be within five minutes. Um, so APRS has kind of grown along with that. Not only do you, you, know, you, do, you do your local thing and then uh, have the eye gate going into the uh, uh, APRS internet system, but we've even picked up uh, a channel on, uh, on some of the commercial geostationary satellites. Uh, and you, you can't transmit directly to the satellite, but the people who have the channel on that satellite, that APRS channel, they monitor the APRS internet system for any traffic in, uh, designated to go via satellite. And they pull that off, send it up to their geostationary satellite. So on uh, anywhere in the world, you can actually tune into that, uh, that satellite in addition to all the other uh, handful of uh, APRS satellite. Um, so uh, again, talking about the APRS satellite applications, it, it's really getting out there and doing something with ham radio. These are the uh, APRS satellites that I've been involved with over the last uh, uh, 20 years. And uh, currently PSAT uh, is, where is it? PSAT uh, here is, uh, is, is, is still operational. And some of the other ones have uh, gone up and since deorbited. Uh, PCSAT, the very first one we did in 2001, is still uh, uh, marginally operational. So anyway, this is what you get when you look at the uh, APRS uh, channel on the APRS uh, internet system. Uh, these are all the people who have sent their position uh, via satellite. Um, this is showing PSAT is simply a three by five inch card with an APRS digipeter on it. And, but it also included a PSK-31 uh, transponder, um, which can support multiple simultaneous conversations, uh, just using any uh, existing off the shelf. And the reason, it, the way it's able to do that, it has a 10 meter uplink, so that the Doppler is very, uh, is significantly less than it would be on typical VHF and UHF. And so that is uplinked on single sideband channel, and it comes down on an FM audio channel on the UHF. And um, so anyway, there's, this is just showing that there's, uh, uh, with the APR satellite, there's a tremendous potential for data exfiltration or, you know, getting data uh, from amateur radio applications just about anywhere on earth back to your, um, uh, the originator. This is showing that typically if you transmit uh, one packet uh, once a minute uh, at about five watt level, that over this two week period, there was always at least one packet that was uh, that got through as high, as many as eleven on the eighteenth got through that day, but uh, as few as one got through 
on the 24th, for example. But it's a great way to get data back to um, uh, the, the designers. Uh, again, here I was trying to sell um, the users of the amateur satellites as a space uh, uh, multiplier. Um, and of course, APRS is on the International Space Station. In the lower left is the latest hardware that's up, wearing, up there, including the Kenwood uh, radio. And um, a lot of people ha have a lot of fun communicating via the uh, International Space Station. And you can see all the activity that goes via the space station by going to ariss.net. And in the upper right, uh, you see the map of where they are. The left-hand table shows you who was the most recently heard. And you, this is, you're seeing, uh, I guess, LU5YS was four minutes and 18 seconds ago. But then you come down and you see down uh, near the bottom of the table, it, it was six hours, 31 minutes and 59 seconds, for example. Um, and I show, but then all the rest of them at that time period were also six hours ago. So uh, this was clearly a pass uh, starting to be over the Western hemisphere and, and picking up those stations. And of course, down at the bottom of this web page, you can see the raw packets and actually see what uh, each person is transmitting. Uh, QuickCom2 was uh, a, a recent satellite uh, we designed and developed, but uh, it was never flown. Um, because of a snafu with the uh, the FCC and the, the beautiful thing about it was uh, it was going to take so you could store your 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 call sign and position information in your DTMF memory of any HT even a $50 radio uh, from China and using a DTMF tone burst you could transmit your position and uh, you could you could also transmit messages and the idea was to reach out to uh, additional amateur radio operations um, it was launched in 2019. Uh, no, actually, a PSAT 1, no, yeah, PSAT 2 was launched uh, in June 2019. It was uh, working beautifully. And then uh, two months later, the VHF transponder died. Um, that's unfortunately because that's all the APRS activity, but still the PSK 31 and the slow scan TV and the voice transponder uh, with, you know, uh, HF up and uh, FM down is still operational. Um, here's a, my last energy point I wanna make, and that is uh, this was the first satellite that we built of about five or six of them where we actually used full space rated solar cells, the same thing that the Lockheed Martins and the big company use. And to outfit the, the, the little four inch by four inch by six inch satellite is $20,000 of solar cells. That's what you pay when you want maximum power uh, from your, your solar system. Um, and that gave us about three watts worth of power. Whereas if we'd only spent $100 on our solar cells, uh, we would only gotten about a, a watt and a half. So you can double the power by going to the highest, most efficient solar cells, but it's gonna cost you 2000 times as much. And so that's why I like to make this point. Here's my solar array out in my backyard. Uh, I can get three KW for about $1,000. Whereas you compare that to the $20,000 on a satellite to get three watts. So anyway, it's a whole new world of, uh, of energy. And those people who think that they're waiting for higher efficiency cells before they put solar on their house, uh, it's a fool's errand because like I say, the cost of silicon solar cells for your roof uh, have done nothing but go down by orders of magnitude down to uh, uh, only 30 cents a watt and the cost of the high efficiency solar cells has done nothing but go up. And the difference between the two is only a factor of two in efficiency, but it costs a thousand times more. So don't wait. It's time to uh, get involved in all these additional sources of energy. And we put that into the uh, ARL book called Energy Choices for the Radio Amateur. Um, and in the final wrap up, again, this slide shows you that just a couple of solar panels on a carport and you've got uh, free transportation and energy uh, for life. And with that, I'll turn it back to the uh, net control. All right, I'm gonna stop the recording. I did not have a clock like I was